Uh, Larry is a uh, manager of marketing and technical services for Lehigh White Cement Company. Uh, Larry is an accomplished speaker with more than 30 years of experience in the material supply and construction industries. He's an American Concrete Institute fellow and recognized expert on the topics of architectural, decorative, and ultra high performance concrete. He's a past chair of the American Concrete Institute's Decorative Concrete and Plastering Committees and recipient of the 2015 ACI Concrete Sustainability Award. Uh, Larry was a member of the organize, organizing committees for the 2016 and 2019 International Ultra High Performance Concrete Symposiums. He's a certified construction product representative with the Construction Specifications Institute and serves in numerous capacities in concrete industry professional associations. Uh, he's uh, been a USGBC lead accredited professional since 2004. He's a former director of the Delaware Valley Green Building Council chapter of the USGBC and chair for the Lehigh Valley branch. He regularly speaks professionally to architects, engineers, students, and green building professionals on the topic of architectural and ultra high performance concrete. Uh, multiple affiliations, um, American Concrete Institute, Precast, Pre-Stressed Concrete Institute, Architectural Precast Concrete Association, and the Construction Specifications Institute, and has also published numerous articles and papers. But for now, uh, we're gonna play this pre-recorded session. Today, I wanna to talk about meeting design goals with architectural concrete. And I'm gonna be using a really uh, exciting, beautiful project, uh, The Reach, which is an expansion project at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, DC. One of the things that people don't understand about architectural concrete is they tend to think that because it's beautiful, it isn't necessarily a structural uh, material. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, architectural concrete is just as strong, uh, as long as it's designed correctly, of course, it's just as strong as any gray concrete. Um, it meets the same specifications. It has the same basic materials in its makeup. And um, it tends to be higher consistency. And it takes more effort to achieve that consistency. So in general, it tends to be higher quality because the effort taken to improve its consistency will necessarily make it um, its performance a little bit better because people are paying better attention to the material. So uh, some examples of um, just how strong architectural concrete can be. Um, there are architectural precasters who cast high performance mixes every day. Uh, it's what they do as, a, as their standard uh, business model is they're producing high performance architectural concretes. Uh, and of course, you can also make ultra high performance concrete with white Portland cement as the base material. Um, we actually produce a UHPC with the Allboard brand that's, um, that meets these characteristics. UHPC will have minimum 20 day strengths of 120 MPA to 150 MPA, 17,500 PSI or uh, 22,000 PSI, depending on the application. Another good um, example of where architectural concrete is made for structural performance is the reach at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. You can see that Vulcan Materials, the ready mix concrete producer for the job, uh, produced different mix designs based on different applications that meet 6,000 up to 12,000 PSI concrete. So uh, definitely a very high performance concrete here at the reach in Washington, DC. Another uh, example is uh, the um, Western Hemisphere's tallest residential building. Uh, it's 432 Park Avenue is a high rise in um, near downtown New York, uh, right off of Central Park, Park Avenue, of course. Uh, this project is seven or 1400 feet tall and utilized 14,000 PSI concrete. Uh, it was self-consolidating concrete that was pumped all the way from the ground level up to the top of the structure, 1,400 feet high. And um, it, you know, it, it's just a, a real testament to 
uh, architectural concrete that it was able to be used in this uh, highly uh, structural manner and, and you know high performance application. When we're talking about architectural concrete versus standard gray or just uh, plain Jane structural concrete, the three things that we focus on are going to be color, form, and finish. And so the color uh, for a specific project will predominantly come from the material itself. So the concrete itself, the color is going to be uh, going to be dictated by the raw materials that you use to make the concrete. And then uh, the application of the concrete in place on the site and how the light uh, will affect that different uh, aspects of the, of the project will certainly affect the way it's viewed. And uh, it's something important to look at. You can see this beautiful reflecting pool uh, at the reach of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, uh, where the architect anticipated the views and has really produced just a, a, a neat project uh, to visit and uh, to inspire people about John F. Kennedy uh, Center for the Performing Arts. The other thing that you want to look at is your form. In other words, what is the concrete relief all about? What is the texture of it? That's going to be uh, in the mold or the forms, as we call them. Uh, and you can use different form liners to give you that different texture and give you that different um, profile for the face of your, your concrete. And um, these forms can be very complex or they can be fairly simple. And the more complexity tends to drive up your cost. Uh, so, you know, look at the, um, the budget and what you can afford, and then you can make uh, adjustments from there. The finish predominantly talks about essentially how much of the matrix of the concrete that you're actually going to see. Uh, is it just the form finish, which is that paste edge, you know, the, the very face of the concrete, or have you uh, eroded the face away of the, of the paste and that hard form finish and gotten back into the, to the fine and coarse aggregates to reveal the matrix from underneath? Um, architectural concrete is a balance. So you're going to look at those three different uh, things, the color, the form, and the finish, and you can adjust those um, to give you different looks here. The, as we talked about, the mix establishes the color. The form or the mold is going to give the concrete its permanent shape. And then the finish uh, is going to give you that visibility of the matrix. Uh, by adjusting those different materials or the form and the finish, you can get a tremendous uh, variation, which will give you an artistic or an architectural effect. The neat thing about architectural concrete is it's very sustainable because you're making the concrete material itself be the finish, be the, the material that you want to see. So you don't have to coat that with something that won't last nearly as long. You're going to make that concrete the final product. And so um, utilize uh, white cement for bright colors. Choose supplementary cementitious materials such as slag or metacalin. They're a light color when you want to get a bright color. Uh, make sure that you're choosing the correct aggregates to complement your mix. And then, of course, um, you're going to end up with a very strong, resilient, long-lasting material, which, of course, is a, a baseline for green building and sustainability. So um, here's a typical mix design from North America. Uh, as you can see, uh, the, the paste portion is what's going to dictate your color more than anything else. So the paste is going to be the combination of the cement, supplementary cementitious materials, uh, pigments, uh, any pigment that you add to the concrete, very fine aggregate particles, essentially the dust from any of the aggregate that you have in the mix, all of these combine to color the paste. The paste will give you that background color. The paste goes everywhere and coats everything. And so it will give you the, the tone or the look of the concrete overall will be dictated by the paste portion of the mix. And then after the paste, the, uh, which is dominant you know, by the cement and the other fine materials comes the aggregate. First, the fine aggregate, which is sand, and uh, and then the coarse aggregate will will affect your color from there. 
the REACH project at the Kennedy Center uh, utilized a white sand from Maryland, which helped complement the white cement and the other materials to give it that marble-like finish. For architectural concrete, it's important that you choose the right supplier. So for cast in place, that's going to be the ready mix supplier. Um, Vulcan Materials was the producer, concrete producer, uh, ready mix supplier for this project. Um, they did a, a terrific job. Uh, they have a lot of experience with architectural concretes, and um, they had the ability to uh, use a plant that they could reach the project that was uh, that they could isolate and specify only produce architectural concrete for this job, which so that kept the cement all the same, the raw materials the same. They didn't have to worry about contamination. And uh, it really gave them uh, a leg up on the project to produce this job. Um, the other neat thing that's important about uh, choosing your producer is the experience they have. Like I said, our, uh, Vulcan has a lot of experience with architectural concrete. They have intimate knowledge of the local materials and the types of mixes that they're able to produce, to produce and uh, the different effects that those colors uh, will, will get for them. So it's important as, as the designer that, um, that you manage your expectations and that you set your expectations based on that local experience, based on what uh, aggregates are available in the area, and then uh, make sure that you uh, work with your suppliers and, and let them know that you're going to want to do multiple mock-ups, uh, perhaps, or different test pours to make sure that you're going to test out and prove out what those mixes should look like. The other thing that you want to make sure about that producer is that they have that they work with their their drivers and uh, the different uh, people who are uh, involved with the project. You want to make sure that the trucks are clean. You want to make sure that they're only hauling uh, that architectural mix or a light colored mix. You don't want to have them uh, go straight from a gray job and then try to produce an architectural job without a a thorough washing of the truck. Um, same thing with any of the equipment that's going to touch the concrete. You want to make sure that the pumps are clean, that the uh, forms are clean, and that the um, contractor who's going to be placing the concrete understands the requirements for the aesthetics that you're trying to achieve. Make sure that they understand that you're trying to get an architectural concrete so the color is important. So they have to treat it specially. They have to be careful, make sure they're not dragging any, any contaminants into the concrete, et cetera, uh, and keep it clean, essentially. So the mixed design, like we talked about, will set your color. Um, the paste proportion of that uh, is, is the most important part of it, once again. Um, you have to sometimes do trade-offs. So for this Kennedy Center, they have green building targets. Uh, the, this is going to be a... Uh, certified lead job, and so uh, it's important that the uh, that the mix had supplementary cementitious materials, and so uh, the color at the reach, they started with white Portland cement, Alborg Portland type one cement, uh, and that very consistent, um, very uh, reliable color for that project. They added slag. Uh, some of the mixes had up to 40% slag in there. Uh, the slag is a, a light colored, almost white supplementary cementitious material. It is uh, a little bit off white. So um, when it was combined with the local sands available to the project, they found that they wanted to brighten up that mix just a little bit more. Um, the mix was about 85% of the way there. They added titanium dioxide to get it the rest of the way to the bright white that they finally achieved and that they wanted to use on the project. Um, titanium dioxide is just a white pigment uh, used to do that. Pigments are very strong coloring agents, and they can really help uh, take you to the next level as far as colors go. So um, just a kind of a break here in the in the narrative, it is worth mentioning that architectural precasters, I talked briefly about them at the beginning, they have some advantages over this uh, that are that can be useful to the architect. Uh, you can see um, they have uh, very experienced crews that deal with architectural concrete all the time. 
They have very good control. Um, they understand, you know, they're working with it every day. So they understand um, the different procedures that they need to take to make sure that they uh, protect the color of the concrete. Um, and it, it can simplify the owner's or the specifier's role because essentially uh, that owner or specifier can choose a, uh, a color and a finish and then just leave it to the architectural precaster who will do the rest. The, a lot of the guesswork is taken out of it. Um, and, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, you can see here, uh, you know, just this is a crew that does it every day. So they, they know how to get, give you the architectural concrete that you want. So uh, whether you're using a precast or a cast in place application, um, the form finish and the, and the things that make a form finish uh, the way it is, is the same. So um, the, the, that form or mold finish highlights the paste. Remember, it gives you that very crisp, clean lines. Uh, it's going to uh, have a very smooth, tight, dense appearance. And the concrete is going to show you everything that is that is associated with that job. You can see the form liners. The, the architect developed this, what they call crinkle concrete that they use for acoustic uh, relief and uh, help break up the sound within some of these uh, different performing uh, uh, venues within uh, the performing arts center. You can see here's the form liner. I'm, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but there's a there, there's square pattern on that wall that's facing us. Uh, you can see with a taper tie hole, et cetera, um, there's minimal penetrations in this wall, and this is a very dense, solid surface. You can also see that um, the slag, in this case, in some of these, uh, on some parts of this wall, you can see that slight bluing color, that darker color. That's the slag before it is oxidized out. That that um, that discoloration will typically go away. Um, and uh, where you need it to be white, white, uh, typically, you can just uh, reduce the amount of slag, and or if you if you don't need to have the slag in there, uh, you don't have to worry about that bluing effect from the ground granulated blast furnace slag. Um, the form will be the result that you're going to get. In other words, that whatever the uh, inside, the face of the form is up against the concrete, that's going to give you a true representation when you strip it. So form liners uh, can give you all kinds of dramatic effects. The, um, the architect at the reach chose this uh, rough cut uh, Douglas fir strips of wood uh, that gives you a very neat uh, kind of a natural texture to the, to the walls. It's really very effective, very, very pretty uh, when it's all put into place. And really, as far as whatever you're going to line your forms with, there's no limit to it. Uh, it's all what you want to make sure is that the material should be non-absorptive um, and that you can afford them in your budget, essentially. One of the things to consider is, is the depth of the relief. Uh, if you have uh, very deep patterns, it can, it can become more difficult to strip uh, the forms. And you also have to make sure that the, that the uh, clearance for any reinforcing uh, from the surface is is a good two inches behind the deepest uh, part of your form liner. So uh, make sure that you consider those. Um, you can use utilize um, you know stock form liners or customized. You can see this is the custom pattern that was achieved using that uh, those strips of wood on the inside of the forms is really really very telling. It's very neat uh, to see. Um, we talked a little bit about mock-ups. We'll talk about them over again because it's so important to evaluate ahead of time what that surface is going to look like. Uh, here are some uh, images of some small mock-ups that were done uh, for different kinds of, of layouts for the wood and different uh, forming oils and stripping materials used to make sure that they achieve the look that they're trying to get. So um, make sure that... Uh, uh, that you that you utilize mock-ups and test pours uh, effectively, and that'll that'll get you the project that you want at the end of the day. So uh, the the concrete is cast in. Once you once you cast that wall and you've stripped the forms, you're pretty much done. So 
the mock-ups give you a trial, an opportunity to, to test out different mixes and to uh, evaluate the color and the look that you're getting. And then it also helps you, um, you know, plan ahead for, for how you're going to address openings, how you're going to address joints, et cetera. Those should all be specified as part of the mock-up. You want to make sure that everyone in the project knows you're going to be doing mock-ups and what's expected. You want to have all the different uh, kind of uh, things that will be encountered at the project itself to be represented in that mock-up. And that gives you an opportunity to see how you're going to uh, treat different conditions within the jobs. Another, it's important to um, to try to basically have some flaws in the mock-up and show how you're going to do some repairs because um, you know how you're going to achieve a good-looking uh, job at the end is is important to to detail out. So the role of the architect, besides having that vision of what the project will look like, is to uh, make sure that you specify um, you know what the texture was going to be. Uh, you're, or do you want to use form liners? Uh, don't you? What what colors you're trying to achieve? Identify the the finish. Uh, ask for examples. There are many different architects may be able to point to projects and examples of uh, different features that they can they can give you uh, from uh, previous projects. And then um, make sure that you engage with the engineers because um, it's a lot easier sometimes to draw something on paper than it is to produce it uh, in real life. So it's important to have that uh, specified as well and get the engineers involved. Think about how hard it is going to be to um, form up the wall and strip off the forms when you're done. And then, of course, as part of that overall effect is to think through what you know, how the water's uh, going to be handled on the project. Make sure that uh, you're not, you know, that you carry away any waters or you provide a drip edge so that you're not carrying any uh, pollutants or any dirt or soot onto the face of your concrete. Make sure that you've taken care of that so that you don't end up with a, uh, a place where the water runs down and carries, you know, a stain essentially onto the face of the face of the job. In the finishes, the form finish, like we talked about, will give you that hard, dense look to it. If you expose the matrix, it'll give you a different texture, a different feel. It can certainly affect the color. One of the ways that we do that is with sandblasting. There's a uh, light blast to the right side of this image, and then a medium blast uh, on the left, medium to heavy. Uh, you can also achieve these kind of finishes with chemical retarders. Um, basically, um, you know, form oils or form release agents can be made so that they will etch the surface as you strip them off. Uh, it you can then wash it down, and you get this exposed. Uh, matrix to the concrete. You can acid etch it, or you can also do mechanical tooling. You can bush hammer it, you can polish it, etc. Sandblasting is very common in the precast industry because they have a essentially a factory setting where have they have a designated area where they can do the sandblasting. Uh, typically, uh, medium blast is is the most forgiving and the most common uh, specified type of finish. Uh, it will expose the sand and a little bit of the coarse aggregate. It typically will not get very deep into the to the panel to expose uh, the aggregate. You want to have just just a little bit showing of that aggregate typically. Uh, and it leaves a slightly roughened surface um, as opposed to the form finish. You get like a sugar cube or a, a sandstone kind of a feel to it. Like we talked about, the uh, form release agents, you can um, the different uh, suppliers can give you uh, various depth of etch according to the different form release um, that you've specified or that's been used on the project, and that will give you different uh, levels of exposure of the matrix. It's important that the contractor use a non-staining form release. Make sure that that is part of the description of the project when you're writing your specifications. It should be applied the same way every time. Typically, these are applied at very thin layers 
onto the forms, uh, and that will achieve the best performance, the the most consistent look to that to that concrete. Um, self consolidating mixes tend to be easier to place. Make sure that the uh, ready mix supplier, the concrete supplier, uh, has a good technical background to control these mixes. Uh, they rely on chemical admixtures to get them to these high slumps. And so they tend to be a little bit more technically challenging. Uh, and it's important that the, the control is there. Um, the contractor, of course, has a very large role in placing the concrete. Um, they want to, you want to match the mock-up every time. You want to make sure that uh, there's good technique with the vibration of the form, you know, vibration of the concrete within the forms and or external vibration of the forms themselves. You want, the other thing that's important is you want to have an uninterrupt, uninterrupted pour. In other words, from beginning to end, you want to make sure that there's no uh, delivery issues so that the concrete is there when you need it so that you won't have a cold joint. Uh, plan for uh, breaks in the, uh, in the sequencing of the concrete. Uh, if there's a joint where you want it to be, everyone can prepare for that and build it into the project as opposed to being surprised because trucks were delayed or you had some other issue. Uh, and then uh, sacking and patching after the fact um, can be a real art. Uh, you know, working with, uh, that's why you want to make sure that these conditions are shown in the mock-up. How, how are you going to go and do any repairs or fill any uh, tie holes, et cetera, on the project? So it's important that we start with a vision. Here's a, an excellent uh, example of that of the reach at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Uh, Stephen Hole Architects uh, were, had the vision for this, just a tremendous project. Um, you can see that they combined the practical application of accommodating a lot of different uh, performing arts uh, venues within the project and the need to provide a welcoming uh, open uh, a place for the public to uh, to be engaged and then also take care of all the needs for for all the different kinds of uh, places that are there the, the what what you see here is almost like a park light setting is to, is actually green roofs that um, that have uh, basically a park on top of them uh, underneath uh, the ground, there's everything from parking to different classrooms and uh, venues for uh, performances within that project. Um, they did an excellent job of understanding the materials and how to get the look that they wanted. And um, of course, this project, like we talked about, has sustainability goals that we expect to be uh, met with a certification by LEED. Um, so the, the engineers and the architects got together and they determined that to have that park-like setting, which is the green roof on top of the different uh, parts of the project, that they would want to lighten the slab. So um, they basically wrote it into the specifications and the description of the job. They put it in the plans that they would lighten the load of the concrete to accommodate the load of the park like above. And if essentially one of the things that, that's important to remember is that if you don't put it in the specification, it won't be in the job. So you have to make sure that the specifications are, are going to outline exactly what you want and how you intend to get it. And that this project at the REACH, one of the ways they did that is by lightening the slabs using these voided slab systems. Um, the other thing that they did is they specified that they wanted to have minimal penetrations in the walls, that the walls needed to have a finished look and that external bracing was gonna be widely used for the formwork. Minimal ties inside the wall between the forms and where they were left in place, they tended, they tended to be stainless steel to make sure that there'd be no staining in the future. And those external braces were used like to great effect uh, because these walls were so tall and that they were self-consolidating mixes. He had very high um, form pressures up to 
18,000 PSI uh, form pressure. So special materials, special techniques that were uh, engineered ahead of time to make sure that the walls that they achieved, that the project that they were casting uh, achieved the goals that they had in mind. The other thing that it's important to do is include the owner as a member of the team on this. So um, uh, the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts was the owner of this job. They were highly motivated. They had this, the vision that the architect had presented. They understood it, and they were able to work with the architect to, to solve it problems, you know, to address issues as they came up. And because they had the same vision, they were able to work with them and and uh, make sure that this this job happened in the way that they that they wanted. And so they they got the end result that they were looking for. They have structural application of architectural concrete. And they are uh, very much, you know, solving problems with engineering, not taking guesswork. They were managing expectations. Uh, it's very, this is a very good role for the contractor and the engineer to work with the owner to make sure that they understand the cost of what it's going to take to uh, achieve a vision and um, to see, you know, see it through. Because if you know how you're going to form, you know, address a problem ahead of time, you're going to know the cost and you can anticipate that and plan for it and make decisions and trade-offs as you go. So it's certainly a, a great idea to engage with the uh, all the team members early, talk through the issues, make sure that everyone understands the overall effect that you're trying to get. One of the things that uh, we can applaud the uh, the builders of the the reach and the, and the JFK Center for the Performing Arts is how they were able to uh, combine engineering solutions to achieve those artistic, those architectural effects that they were looking for. It's both practical and beautiful at the same time. Um, they, they evaluated their environment, what they wanted to achieve ahead of time, and then they used all three elements, color, form, and finish, to come up with a really stunning project. So uh, they chose white cement because they wanted a clean, bright finish. Um, of course, it's a white color, so it's very bright, and it's very consistent because the cement doesn't change color. White cement is going to be very consistent, and it's going to, of course, be very strong, and it will complement the fine aggregates that were chosen for this job, a white sand. Um, and it really is just a terrific project. Um, our hats off are to the the whole team involved with building the reach at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Thank you to uh, uh, those team members that help us uh, understand how they achieved this. And uh, I just want to thank you guys for your attention. And uh, we appreciate the opportunity to uh, discuss this really neat project. Thank you very much for listening.